Uh, good. This is Wednesday, October 21st, 2020. We are in a prep call toward the Open Global Mind workshop that we're having on the 22nd and 29th. Um, and whatever else comes up. Um, so just kind of catching up and seeing where everybody is. <clears throat> and I got a note that, that um, George had been waiting in the waiting room since 8 a.m., but I think he had 7 a.m. Pacific or something. So I wrote him and I hope he, uh, he shows up. Yay, Ken. Hi. It's Gri Grizzly Homer. Uh, you're muted. There Hello, you. good morning. Hey there. Um, before, just sort of let's dive in. Let's, let's not do a round of, of check-ins right now, but let's uh, head toward anything anybody's curious about, about the workshops, because I don't know that we've done the best job of laying everything out, but what are just any, any question at all is uh, good to ask at this point. Um, I wonder if you could give a quick recap of what what the prep is and maybe you know kind of what the uh, what's the elevator pitch for where we are where we're going cool um so there's a bunch of different kind of sparks to uh, open global mind to the reason we're sitting here and i can go back and, and tell a piece of that story as well but what we're trying to do right now is figure out um, to get a little bit more uh, collimation, congruence, cohesion, harmony, resonance, uh, and then maybe more mission, structure, objectives, uh, approaches, process, uh, to use different language around what are we doing here? What are we aiming at? Uh, how do we work together? And to that end, Matt Saia and his crew at Collective Next have offered to host a workshop. Uh, and the workshop was going to be just on the 29th. And then because this is a, a big and multi-part thing with many, you know, many people interested and involved, it's turned into kind of a rolling workshop where uh, tomorrow on the 22nd, we're going to start looking at what's, you know, we're going to divide up into, um, we're going to do breakouts and whoever has created something by tomorrow, uh, we'll, we're going to sort of look at those and see what that is. In, really in order to generate more of those, and so that we can have a whole bunch of ideas on the table uh, by the 29th, where there's a, a program for five hours that has us separate up, uh, pitch each other our ideas, hopefully some of which we've watched beforehand uh, because we will have posted them on Medium or wherever or on YouTube, and then synthesize uh, each group's ideas and then come back into plenary and try to synthesize the larger ideas. And the sort of the magnets for what to talk about and what, what we're interested in are in uh, a document that Matt put up, which I'm not staring at right this minute. I'll, I'll go find it and put up the link in a second. Um, I'm sure Pete has it and we'll put it up in a second as well. Um, and the, the document basically says, uh, has a couple key questions up at the top uh, that roughly correspond to what I'm saying. And then some other questions that are just operationally, we would love to walk away from this workshop having answered these kinds of questions. Hi, Christina. Hi, Stacy. Um, and so, uh, and OGM is kind of intentionally broad. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of different kinds of questions to ask. Also, OGM has attracted people who have specific interests in particular domains, whether it be education or food, the food system and soil fertility, soil health, uh, or finance and economics and next generation economics. Uh, or, or the philosophy of how to fix the world. And this workshop is not for any one of those specifically, but it's meant to try to figure out how does OGM help all of those uh, special domain interests do their work even better. Um, and so we're, we're trying to answer a, a bunch of different questions like that. Um, so tomorrow is just the hour and a half, the regular sort of 90 minute time slot for the Thursday calls. Uh, but we will do mostly breakouts there to, to share ideas and come back into plenary toward the end. And then the following Thursday has a program uh, that runs five hours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, the following Thursday has a program that goes uh, five hours. And uh, what part, we have some open questions like, okay, so uh, other than creating media and adding hashtags to the media, so I'm, we're suggesting the hashtag uh, Da, 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 OGM 2025, because the conceit of the workshop is 
uh, let's pretend it's five years from now and that OGM is a success. Let's pretend that, that OGM is flying and doing well. Um, what, what made it get there? What, what, what caused us to succeed? And what are we doing that works really well, right? And it's nice because um, a brief, brief tangent, but um, one of my mentors uh, early in life was a guy named Russell Acuff, uh, who was one of the people who invented systems thinking. There's probably a half dozen, eight or 10 people, uh, Stafford Beer, Arduous and Schoen, Eric Trist, well, West Churchman, most, mostly unfortunately men. Uh, this doesn't overlap that well with uh, Margaret Mead and sort of anthropologists of the same era. This is a, a different kind of a different group. Um, but I studied under Russ when I was at Wharton and also a, a little bit under West Churchman and Churchman was Russ's mentor. Um, and they were busy inventing um, uh, systems theory, systems thinking the way we think it now. So in, a long time ago in the 80s, my mind was blown open in, in the sense of Russ would say, there's really sort of no such thing as a problem. There are systems of problems and you can't extract data for one problem in society, optimize the results using operations research techniques, plug those things back in and expect the thing to work. To work. You have to actually think of the whole system and then do, do systems kinds of interventions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, awesome, thanks, Christina. Um, and, and, and one of the things I loved about Russ was that he could express really sophisticated ideas in 10th grade language. And one of the things that irritated his peers in, in sort of the academic community was that he refused to write academic papers. He wrote books for management and he consulted to all sorts of large companies and a bunch of, he's also consulted to Iran and Mexico, Iran before the, the before the overthrow. Um, and he had a process called idealized redesign that I participated in, which was really cool. And he would have people get together and uh, first he would soften the ground. So if he would soften their minds for, in, in this case, two days worth of lectures by him telling what were called ACOS fables, basically stories from his consulting career about how to solve problems in, in very different ways, which was super cool. And then he would bring people together in tables of seven plus or minus two, sort of uh, Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two, because that's how many things you can pay attention to and remember uh, uh, with different departments and different levels in the organization. So the VP of marketing might be next to the janitor. And that was totally cool. And he would then move them through an idealized design workshop where he would say, you show up on Monday and your factory and your headquarters have burned to the ground. All of your records are gone. Your database is gone. And this is in this is in the 80s, so this is early. Everybody doesn't have a PC on their desk kind of thing quite yet. It was kind of getting there. Um, but everything's gone. Now reinvent your company starting from the mission statement. And we would walk through that. And it was, it was like, and then once you had something to aim for that you understood was plastic, then you creating some kind of plan or making decisions in the now was easier because given two candidates for a position who were basically equivalent, roughly you couldn't sort of distinguish them on qualifications. You could then look at the vision and go, which of these two candidates matches this future better? And that gave you a different sort of discriminant for who you wanted to bring in or what you wanted to do or what your next thing was gonna be. Um, anyway, long, I guess longer digression than I intended, but I was sold really, really early on on the idea of trying to get what you know what you might call beginner's mind and envision some interesting new reality and then find your way to it because the incremental thing we tend to get stuck in and, and here i'll put in sort of um, i am no mathematician but this idea of local minima in a, in a fitness landscape and and we tend to get stuck in little local pools we tend to get, we tend to get stuck in local remedies and unless you kind of float up high enough and think about things that are so you know different enough you wind up coming back into that local pool because humans adapt really well. We, we groove behaviors really well. Uh, we like sort of things that we're accustomed to. We build systems and habits uh, easily. So getting somewhere different is actually kind of hard for humans. And all too often it requires trauma or tragedy or, or crisis. And fortunately and unfortunately, we seem to be driving our, our collective truck into a series of, of, of crises. So, uh, the good news of that is that it's probably going to drive some change. The bad news is that it may not be the change we choose. It may, it may lead down entirely the wrong uh, sort of rat holes. Um, so that's a, a bit of framing for why OGM 2025. And then we're asking people to put together uh, media of some sort, a blog post or a video or whatever. Ooh, cool. 
Um, oh, thank you. It's for, uh, and you 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 cruised it. That's awesome. Uh, this is this is I'm I'm getting a little tiny taste of what it would be like to have an OGM conversation, right, Pete? Um, and um, because normally I would have gone and, and done a, done what Pete just did in my brain while talking and screen shared and blah blah blah, and it, it, it sort of didn't occur to me to start doing that because I was trying to keep the digression kind of short. But but there's this juicy sort of thread of who's been thinking about this for a long time, which trickles down into. OGM neighbor communities, the kinds of groups that I would love to approach to connect in to OGM uh, sort of for a two-way exchange of value. And, and a piece of what we're trying to figure out in this workshop is what is OGM's unique value? Like, like what, what do we bring to the party? Why are we here? Why don't we just dissolve and join Theory U? Why don't we just dissolve and join Game B? Why don't we just dissolve and join? And I can name, and I've, and I've got a really long collection um, if you go to OGM neighbor communities and scan that, that would be really interesting because that list would be super useful um, uh, in the chat because browsing it takes a while, but if you can just sort of see it and cruise down, that's cool. Um, and so, well, and I think that we have certain things that we're looking at in ways that we're doing things that are in fact considerably different, but I think we can also borrow a tremendous amount of DNA from neighboring communities who've done things really well. We don't need to reinvent everything from scratch. Um, we need to borrow wisely, appropriate and adapt, and then add to it our point of view, our perspective, our secret sauce, you know, to all beef patties. No, the secret sauce recipe was never made public, was it? Um, but you remember memorizing that little ditty, right? Yeah, um, only if, if you're of a certain age, sorry. Um, but but we're sort of aiming toward that. Um, and so what we'd like is for people to create some media, post it, share it, for us to do like flipped workshops so that we can watch a lot of this before we ever get to the conversations. That would be great. So between now and the 29th, we're hoping a bunch of people create points of view about what to do, answering the questions that are in the document that uh, Pete shared in the, in the chat earlier, which is sort of the, the workshop uh, design document, uh, and then collect this up together to create our own working uh, agreements about how do we work, how do we, how do we, for example, um, how do we, for example, approach another community and build a bridge? What does that mean? And who sort of, how do we explain ourselves to them? What do we offer them? Uh, how do we bring them in? All of that, that's probably a little, a little uh, rhythm or path or, or trope that we'll figure out and we'll do. How do we uh, get a work group that cares about something. And right now there's a little subgroup called Free Jerry's Brain, which is mostly um, extremely geeky people and me. And we're trying to figure out how to get me out of the brain software and into something uh, more open, more shared, more whatever. But the shorter term goal is just how to extract some of my brain data into a space where we can experiment with it, which is much more short term, which, which we're sort of pretty close to having, which is part of what Pete is doing right now. Um, so, so that's a subgroup. So one of the things that we need to figure out in this workshop is how do subgroups go say, who wants to play with this, go do it, come back, report into the whole and say, here's what we learned. Here's how it fits. Here's how it improves our view of what we're doing. So that, that's a, a thing we need to figure out. Um, so part of this is to figure out what, what do we borrow? Well, um, how do we do that? Oh, awesome. That's the, that's the list. It's a long list. Um, Christina, what are you asking? I'm wondering if you can follow a, th a thread like Akov really built on, um, I can't remember even, either James or William James or a student of James. William James, yeah. They, they, they go back through Churchman to James. So I'm wondering who recently is like the most uh, direct lineage Descendant. in terms of thinking this is a little bit of like, idealized design sorry this is a little bit like who goes who trained under a sensei uh, in aikido there's this yeah, yeah. lineage and dojos and all that um uh there so the weird thing for me and you all may have different opinions is that when you say systems theory i see like uh, baskin robbins of systems theory today i see that 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 like you you, you tap 12 people and ask them what systems thinking is and you'll get 12 sort of different but overlappy answers with very different framing and language. And so systems theory seems to me to have 
melted into the landscape in some sense. Um, and, and, and Christina, I don't know if that's different for you. Uh, I was like, just Google it, man. Yeah, and, and I can go back, and idealized design was, was, I don't think anybody ever reified that. I'm not sure he wrote a book about it. It was one of his many tools. Uh, I think so he did. Kind of, Peter put a link a, in that I found a book on. Oh, cool. Well, that's great. I didn't even know about that. I'll have to add that to my brain. Um, it was in your brain. I'll have to realize that I put it in my brain. How about that? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so I know a few people who studied under Ikaf who are still around. In fact, Peter Senge um, uh, attributes a lot to, to Ikaf. So he, he and, uh, I, I think he studied under Ikaf, not sure, but Senge's, Senge's pretty major. And he, Senge kind of popularized systems thinking as a corporate approach back in the 80s. Um, so he, he kind of opened that door wide for people. But, but ACOP was extremely corporate friendly, which is super interesting to me. Um, he consulted, he knew Augie Bush Sr. Of, of the Anheuser-Busch family of Anheuser-Busch before they got sucked up into India. Uh, he knew Forrest Mars of the Mars Company, one of the world's largest private companies. He was consulting to Alcoa, Martin Marietta, um, the governments of Iran and Mexico. Uh, and a bunch of other large companies I'm forgetting right now. Um, but he, he, was, he was very, very credible uh, as a corporate consultant and then has had a bit of a revival recently. Um, yeah, who comes down from Senge is a really interesting question. And I don't know whether Otto Scharmer in theory you connect up into that lineage. I think there is some, some connection there and Otto is doing really well as, uh, as well. But um, anybody else have, have thoughts of who, who would belong under that umbrella or in, the, in that? in that descent? Not so much. Um, and at one point, um, I, have a, I have a desk at a little design firm here called Ziba Design. And Ziba means beautiful in Farsi because the guy who founded this thing 36 years ago, uh, his family was in the US when the Shah was overthrown. And so they had to say. So he became an industrial designer. And then early in my sort of tenure there, I have uh, weekly thinkathons with people. I took a big whiteboard and I did a history of systems thinking and then a history of design, uh, trying to include all these things like user experience design, <clears throat> you know, all the different variants of that, and then put some names on this chart and sort of left to right over time, uh, trying to point to the fact that we're heading towards some kind of fusion of strategy and design disciplines that nobody's quite mastered. So McKinsey is kind of the, the top dog in the in the strategy business and they've had plenty of uh, bad crises now so their reputation's a bit soiled uh, but then you get ideo which sort of had its rise and, and fall as well but what does that space look like now where we actually intentionally design strategies that are more emergent and, and and to me that that's background that's really interesting for our efforts here because one of the things we might realize we are is we're kind of role models or strategists for building this this interesting future which takes us back to OGM 2025, thank goodness. And I would be excited to, to be part of that, <clears throat> that road trip. Um, let me pause there. That was a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, Christina, that was a, a fun question. Uh, anybody else with a thought? And Jack, we just, uh, we just did a bit of a history on systems thinking, uh, coming to that from an explanation of the workshop that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and Pete is using the, the skim brains uh, functionality we've got in meme brain to dump a bunch of thoughts in the chat, which is like really exciting because it's cool. It's cool to see them spill out um, as we're sitting here talking. That's, it, it's, 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 a, it's an impoverished version compared to actually like using the brain and doing stuff, but it's immediacy and it, it's sort of persistence here in the chat is lovely. Cool. Uh, any other thoughts, questions from there? Additions to the story, curiosities about the story. In the meantime, Jack could probably talk for an hour about how this stuff threaded into um, systems design, uh, software, et cetera, et cetera, because Jack's been through those battles focusing on how humans uh, share knowledge together. And Ken, you had your mouth open, you were about to say something. I, 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 I stepped on that, go ahead. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, you know me, I'm gonna say, what's the role of somatic uh, intelligence in this? Um, 
I wanted to actually make an offer. Um, I, I know the design is pretty firm. I'm not sure if there's any room in there, but I'd like to make an offer at the beginning to maybe take 10 to 15 minutes and bring people into an embodied listening state. So as they go through, um, they're listening from different places than just their heads of, oh, here's how I'm gonna respond to this, or this is what's stirring up for me, but really getting into a different mode of listening than, than usual. Because I think one of the things I've learned over the years is, you know, you just like if you are gonna go out and run a sprint, you don't just start from a dead, you know, stand still and run a sprint. You warm up, you, you know, you jog a little bit, you stretch a little bit. And so, we have a tendency when we get into these um, convocations of we're going to do some really great work of just starting from a standstill and, and racing and some kind of warm up of let's get ourselves, our minds and bodies connected and limber to really be present. So um, that was my, my uh, question and my offer. That sounds great. I will, I will put that in front of Matt and we will slide that in the, in the schedule. That sounds really, really, really good. And, and it re reminded me of something else. Hey, Mark, I'm it reminded me of something else, which is um, Akoff, for all that he was a genius at communicating with corporations and explaining really complicated things in simple ways, <clears throat> had like really low emotional intelligence and social intelligence and was, was kind of clunky. Like his, his wife worked in the same building in the library and when they left work, she was 20 paces behind him and they would kind of go off. Uh, and and just another weird little tangent. At the same time, uh, I took a class because uh, at the Wharton School, you could take classes from any of the other graduate divisions, which was really cool. It's one of the reasons I, I wanted to go there. And so I took a course from uh, Ed Bacon, who was uh, the head of the School of, Arch uh, of uh, Architecture and Urban Planning. And Ed Bacon had been the city planner of Philadelphia for 50 years. And so I took a course from, from Acoff and Bacon at the same time and their social intelligence were at opposite ends of the spectrum. And Bacon was like just phenomenally on point with it. And just watching what they had done, their achievements, their lack of it, where they had not achieved things and fallen flat was, was super, uh, super interesting. And a tiny footnote, uh, anybody know who Ed Bacon's son is? You can do this, Pete, I thought you'd do this. Kevin Bacon, so I'm two degrees. Uh, and, and also, Ed Bacon had three kids, two of whom, one of whom is Kevin Bacon, the other two of whom are a conductor and a musician who were like really, really talented, like, like really interesting and fruitful. Uh, Acuff was busy doing things in West Philly with local um, youth that really turned into a productive thing for, for Philadelphia. And then when those individuals moved away, the whole situation went south. Uh, so there was all this sort of learning about development and all that was really, it was super cool. I was very lucky. And, and the reason, there we go. Uh, and the reason that I knew at all about ACOF is that at the beginning of my second year, one of my roomies who was in the program said, come with me, there's a seminar you should drop in on. And so we, he just walked in with me. We sat down at a table, you know, six or eight students and ACOF at the head of the table telling ACOF's fables. And I'm like, oh my God, and my head like started to explode. So I, so I started taking courses in there. Anyway, um, Back to our, our, our show, which is already in progress. Um, other questions or thoughts about how to improve the workshop. And in particular, I think, um, I'm interested in how do, we assemble, how do we assemble answers to some of our important questions as we go. Now, there's a second Google Doc, which is the one that I posted at the first little sort of pre-workshop like this one where we, I just asked a bunch of questions and all of us just poured ideas in and Neil put his big, his di a couple diagrams in there and a few other things. And that's a, that's a really, really rich diagram, uh, rich document that doesn't really map to uh, the design document for this workshop. But a lot of the answers or at least partial answers to the questions are in uh, the second Google doc. Uh, so one question is how might we best collect up and organize our answers so that they're easily browsable. Um, and an ultimate answer to that might be, uh, and this is I think way beyond the range of this workshop, but a, a, an answer that would be happy making for me is how would you create, how would you instantiate an organizational sort of strategy and practice as a pattern language? And what, what would that mean? What would that look like? And I, I would love to, to play with that. Um, and I think if pattern languages are sort of uh, 
uh, pattern languages are to wikis as peanut butter is to jelly. Uh, so it would make a lot of sense for us to put up a small wiki to do just a pattern language or something like that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I could also sort of instantiate a pattern language in my brain where each of the patterns sort of maps in, but they link together as they link, you know, in, in, in a pattern language, that would be kind of fun. But, um, but for this workshop, do we just create a, a Google Drive folder and put a bunch of things in it? Do we have a master spreadsheet or document that has slots for the answers and then bubble down to still answers? How would anybody recommend we go about um, collecting up our answers and, and, and making them shorter, simpler? I mean, part of this is how do we make this simple to, to digest and absorb and propagate? Um, April's been giving talks recently about the future of work. And one of the points she makes is that Netscape's, uh, sorry, not Netscape, <laughs> Netflix's policy for vacations and off time and all that is a five word policy. They don't have a big thick manual. It says, do what's in, do what's in Netflix best interest. I guess that's six words, I'm getting it wrong. But, but it's, it's like a principle uh, approach instead of a whole bunch of things to sort of mind and do which is super interesting. That is, a, that is a crystallization and a distillation combined with an act of trust in the employees that leads to a very different approach toward how, how you know, policy things get resolved. So that's part of it, go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry, I am kind of dropping in and haven't heard what came before and sorry, didn't read the document, but I'm reacting strongly to pattern language. And I do think that it's an opportunity to do, to have a centralized thing as opposed to a Google Drive with many pages to read and nobody will bother reading all the pages because everybody's concerned with their own answer. Whereas if they're forced to interact on one single spreadsheet, you may have a chance that they'll notice something of somebody else's. Um, and, and then the question becomes, what are the slots in the, what are the fields, right? I do think that, uh, of course, there's a question of uh, what, what problem are you trying to address, but scale is hyper important. Uh, is it, you know, uh, yeah, scale, powers, powers of 10. Uh, how many people are involved? Uh, range, of course. And the other thing that's extremely important, I think, is very much a question you asked me at some point, what do you need? Uh, because one thing I'd like to see as an outcome of the workshop is if different projects can build on one another. <laughs> but that means knowing what are the inputs and the outputs, what are the needs and the uh, outcomes for each project. And that should be hyper explicit. Now, I'm sure there's other components, uh, for example, the digital presential mix, uh, on uh, real time offline, uh, you know, fast and slow thinking, these are all interesting criteria. But I think there's something else which is more about what it is, which is different. Of course, spheres of applicability strategy is one yeah. you singled out, it's not the only one. And, and I think probably a couple of people on, on this call don't know what a pattern language is, I'll do the, the two minute backgrounder. Um, there's a, an architect and urban planner named Christopher Alexander, who was up here in Oregon back in the 70s and 80s. He and a bunch of colleagues wrote three books that were really significant back then. One of them is called A Pattern Language. Uh, another one is called The Timeless Way of Building, I think. <clears throat> and the third one is called The Oregon Experiment, which is about a, a, a campus they designed together using these principles. A pattern language says that you can distill wisdom down into these little sub patterns and that these, these patterns kind of nest. So there's 383 or they're about patterns in the book um, and the one that I love that I use as an explanation that kind of makes the point really nicely is called light from two walls. And uh, so mo a good pattern has a beautiful, short, memorable title. And when I say, oh, that we could do that, but that would violate light from two walls. It clicks in place because you understand light from two walls, which is a room to feel warm, inviting, hospitable should probably have natural light from at least two walls. It's not a rule, it's just a guideline. It's just distilled wisdom. And if you have a media room where you're gonna watch movies, you don't need to have two, you know, natural light in it because you're gonna shut down, you're gonna put blinds on the windows and play the big you know, tube in, in front of the room. But, but if you realize this rule and then start walking around the world into rooms, you realize that there's a beautifully decorated room but it's long and narrow and only has a windows to the street over here and that the light is not bouncing around in a warm way. And you'll realize, oh, this room, this room doesn't have light from two sides, light from two walls. 
Um, there we go, light from two sides of every room. Cool. Uh, thanks, Pete. And, and so these things nest. I think the last pattern is make special spaces for kids, for children. And it's like build a little niche where only kids can go and play, something that's special for them. There are, there are patterns for the transition from outside a house to inside a house. There are patterns for the siting of a house in a lot. There are patterns for the placement of doors and windows in a wall. So each of those is its own pattern with a memorable title. Uh, and then there's a, there's a pattern to the patterns, which is like, why does this matter? What is it, uh, et cetera. And that's what makes a really elegant pattern language. And there have been many, many other pattern languages created since then. I collect them in my brain. So I put a link to that uh, in my brain uh, in the chat. Um, so enough on that. Other thoughts on pattern languages while we're on this topic? Pete. Um, I've got a, I've got a obvious, uh, certainly a fondness of um, uh, uh, pattern languages and uh, protectiveness, where I think that when we say, uh, or when I, I hope, when people say a pattern language, um, they actually mean the richness of uh, Alexander's patterns, uh, pattern language, actually. So I, I, like, I guess I like to differentiate between a pattern, um, which might look you know, different, it's got context and a description and, and a solution and things like that. But then a pattern language for me has got the full set of stuff that is in each of Alexander's patterns. And on top of that, it's got uh, hyperlinks between all the patterns um, and, you know, a few connections from each pattern to other patterns. And then also a hierarchy. I think one of the brilliant things about um, Alexander's A pattern language was the hierarchy of stuff going from you know, really big to really small. And um, I worry when people say, when people kind of pick up the Baskin Robbins version of a pattern language, oh, I'm going to talk about, there's a pattern of, I, you know, I see a dog and then I like to pet it. And I see a cat and I like to pet it. Yay, I've invented a pattern language, you know, and, and that makes me super, super sad <laughs> because a pattern language was this brilliant, intellectual construct that conveyed a ton of information in multiple layers of context, not just context locally, but context, you know, a little bit bigger than that and context globally within the whole system. So um, a, a ask for me is when we say a pattern language, we aspire to, you know, the, the example that Alexander gave us. Um, I like that Christina puts in the pattern, soft pets, lower stress. Um, Two small notes. Uh, patterns and wikis are like peanut butter and jelly. The, one of the first wikis ever by um, Lord Cunningham was the Portland Pattern Repository, and he did this with friends. And they actually sort of set up a bunch of software uh, patterns uh, in there, which are pretty interesting. Um, I think one of them is uh, the best is the enemy of the, the, no, what is it? Best? Oh, man, I don't remember it. Uh, best is the enemy of perfection the world. is the enemy of the good. Yeah, but there's a there's a different phrasing point that, that that's like that exactly. Um, and then secondly, um, I have this sort of thesis about design from trust that came up for me in the last decade, and I talk about pattern languages as a form of design from trust because the intention of patterns, or one of the intentions of patterns, as I understand them, is to take civilians who are normally outside the process and arm them with enough language and understanding of the, of the subtleties and important sort of aspects of the task at hand, building a house and putting it somewhere, um, to participate in the design actively. <clears throat> you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of gifting them knowledge and vocabulary and some, some wisdom from the trade so that they become co-designers with you, as opposed to, oh, we, did, we built our own house, which usually means you picked a pattern, you chose what rug to put in, what color to paint the walls, and what knobs to put in the kitchen which is how a lot of people think they designed a house. Uh, so, uh, so to me, pattern languages are important also because they, and I'll, I'll use the word democratize here, but I don't really like that word because it's so complicated, but they, they definitely sort of filter, they, 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 they offer trust out to anybody who cares to absorb what's in the pattern language and participate in that way. And then for our practical purposes, they're a crisp and simple way to absorb how work gets done and what a community believes. <clears throat> oh, cool. Uh, Romer, please jump in. Yeah. Uh, could you please uh, give me a simple uh, description of what a pattern language is? What a, so uh, the, 
the pattern, a pattern language is the book about architecture, urban design, and it has 380 some or 370 some patterns in it. <clears throat> and they, 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 they range from uh, the mix of green space and living space and parking space and workspace all the way down to, I think the last pattern, which is make special places for kids. And any one pattern, and Pete, uh, Pete put a link to light on two sides of every room. So if you click on that link, you can go look at one pattern, which has a title, a, a, a crisp description, like why does this matter? And I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at the link right now, but um, basically if that's a really we good example. We should do a share screen real quick. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, let me just uh, share screen and do that. Ba -ba -da. I'm forgetting my own tools. <clears throat> so here's light on two sides of every room. Um, and so here's sort of, there's kind of like a, this, this pattern and, and in a wiki, each of these would be links to the other patterns. So this is pattern number 159 of all the patterns in a pattern language. This also links to wings of light, positive outdoor space, long thin house. These are all names of other patterns. Uh, here's an image for to, to anchor this pattern. And then here's the statement. When they have a choice, uh, people always gravitate to those rooms which have light on two sides and they will leave the rooms which are lit only from one side unused and empty. It's a pretty big declaration. but. But it's kind of saying that livability varies by the bouncing around of natural light. Therefore, here's what this pattern tries to state, locate each room so that it has outdoor space at, uh, uh, outside it on at least two sides and then place windows on those outer walls so that natural light falls into every room from more than one direction. And then it goes on to explain sort of how, the, how this works. Like, why did we say this? Uh, why does it matter? Uh, and there's a couple of charts sort of uh, showing what's up. And then it goes out and uh, uh, adds a couple more links to other patterns. And, and the, the whole idea of the pattern language is to distill wisdom, hard won wisdom from some domain, from some, some, from some practice area. Thanks, Pete. <clears throat> other thoughts? Yeah, I, I was, very much enthusiastic about uh, pattern language. I still am. I still think it's wonderful. Uh, we are trying to build something emerging. So we're not at the hard won wisdom yet, though we have our individual hard won wisdom. But we have to realize that we're dealing with trying to build a pattern language. Or, or, or some of us may have our own internal pattern language. I'm afraid I don't. But uh, we have to be a bit more lenient with the fact that it's not full fledged well-articulated, well-coordinated uh, pattern language yet. But I think each of our efforts is addressing some patterns we've noticed. And I think that identifying them, and I think that way, yes, it's right that many of us will be addressing many uh, communication pattern flaws, right? Uh, and that's a very different orientation. It's about saying not just what is our project uh, intrant and extrant, but saying, you know, we've noticed these anti-patterns in uh, collective uh, intelligence, collective thinking, and we think we can address those anti-patterns with these processes or tools. And I do want to insist on also processes because, um, hence, I wonder if there's two pattern languages in the building there. And uh, I don't know if it's helpful, but I think being able to say, what are we trying to address is going to be useful actually, because being aware, and here we all have hard won wisdom uh, on anti-patterns of communication and articulating that I'm sure would be a useful outcome. Um, can you go deeper into anti-patterns? I'm not sure I can explain anti-patterns well. There's also dark patterns, which is its own separate topic, but anybody- I'm not can... familiar with dark patterns, so I can distinguish them, but anti-patterns are simply uh, a, 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 a harmful pattern. So you can recognize features because it's a pattern and, and this is an anti-pattern in that you can't, uh, it's something you should know to avoid. And- uh, like uh, electing a president who lies all the time is an anti-pattern. It's yes. it's a good pattern. It it's very it has strong and resonant and does a lot of interesting things, but it seems like most of the things that it does is bad. So it's an anti-pattern. Yeah. Uh, so a dark pattern would be something that's essentially evil. Um, so that would be something like as a world leader, 
I will lie all the time uh, and say that everything is wonderful and that I'm the greatest and that I'm going to make everything good. I've yeah. never had. Yeah, Mark, you, you running for office, about, Pete? Uh, you mentioned about the anti pattern, and it's something that you mentioned that we have to avo avoid. Is this always the case? So, are we caught categorizing this like this is a good thing and this is a bad thing, or is there something in between that? Or you know, of I'm course. not sure what the optimal. Yeah. Heuristics are all about uh, applying things to case, but in the original pattern language design the notion that a pattern should be applied in certain circumstances and not in others. And like there, there was something called forces in the pattern uh, template saying, what, when is this pattern useful? And when is it, uh, it could actually be harmful. An anti-pattern I think is something that is always, pretty much always harmful. Uh, like I know my coding patterns better than my social patterns. So the obvious, uh, uh, coding anti-patterns are also known as bad smells, like big bag of big, big ball of code is the classic example, right? <laughs> uh, you know, go to considered harmful. Uh, when you have, uh, and, and many, often you have the, uh, the anti-pattern as the mirror of the pattern, but there are many of the good patterns very much had domains of applicability. And I think that's absolutely normal. Uh, we're dealing with heuristics. So you also have kind of an epistemological question about you know what's good and what's bad. Um, so in Christopher Alexander's pattern language, what he goes for is what creates the most life, what creates the most vitality. Um, so and light on two sides is actually a good example of something where um, his assertion and and you know our our observation of his obs uh, observation is. Um, uh, assertion uh, is that yeah it does feel more alive if if I'm in a room that's got at least two sides of light so um, uh, so again back to my my example of a, of a hypothetical uh, president um, so an anti-pattern for the country if if it, the anti-pattern for the country in this case is that if we have a president who lies all the time bad things happen hundreds of thousands of people get sick and die um, the dark pattern is interesting because, uh, at least for me, I'm using dark pattern as evil, basically. So uh, the dark pattern is good on one side and bad on the other side. It's good for the president who lies all the time and gets, you know, more success because of it. It's bad for everybody else. So he's being extractive of, of good and turning it into personalized good instead of, you know, social good. And I'll add, just from the perspective of OGM, that chronicling the dark patterns and understanding them well is really, really important. It is almost as important as understanding the positive patterns. And I've got a thought that I'll share in a second, which is like Trump's favorite, his playbook, his favorite tactics. And it connects up to gaslighting, to you know, all kinds of other things, to basically use other people's money, uh, lie constantly, uh, move so fast you can't sort of be caught on stuff, work like the mob, you know, which means I'm, I'm gonna suggest that this might happen. I'm never gonna give the order so that Michael Cohen, when he's testifying, can't say, well, <clears throat> we didn't actually say, go do this thing, but I understood that I should go do this thing. That's how the mafia works, right? So, so I think that making these things explicit then allows you to point to them and say, oh, that's how this person is working. Therefore, maybe they're less trustworthy than we think they are. <clears throat> but these are, also product these, are also, these are also underhanded but valid strategies if you see the world as war. Right. If you, if, you, if you see that, that the world is just a one big war and we need to win at what, whatever means we use are OK, because what matters is staying in power at the end, then these are just tactics. And, and so we're busy applying sort of uh, ethics to, to, to the matter, which then lead us down a particular path of the tactics that are appropriate and those that aren't. But, but on all these things, what's good or bad is at some level, uh, you know, we, when you get to genocide, you're like clearly evil, but then there's like gray areas. At, at what point do you tell white lies in order to get people to do things? And there's a whole group of ethicists and philosophers who would be really interested in that set of patterns and that cluster of ideas of how to create policy, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and then that runs up against whole ethical frameworks like the notion of freedom 
which has eaten our country right now. Uh, there's a whole bunch of bad things being done in the name of, of individual freedom. So ju just, I introduced anti-patterns with a very concrete aim to say that when we document our project, we should say, what anti-patterns are we trying to solve? And maybe what anti-patterns are we still unable to solve and that are still obstacles to us? And again, <clears throat> Can we build on one another's solutions if we found, find that we have different uh, you know, anti-patterns that we can solve? Uh, I think identifying anti-patterns or having kind of two sheets with links between the two sheets, here's the patterns, here's the, here's, here's the, here's the anti-patterns, here's our so the patterns we use in our solutions to solve those anti-patterns and which ones. I think that would make it much richer. Um, so I'm going to propose that one of us, I'm going to ask and <laughs> request that one of us put up a simple wiki for a pattern language for OGM, uh, possibly using the wiki links that we that we just saw <clears throat> um, for sort of the new wiki platforms. Christina and Jack both put up wiki links. I don't know what, if it was to the same, the same uh, wiki. Jack, Jack, yeah, it was the same thing. <laughs> Jack cool. is the tool and, and you can see if if it's visible, I'm not sure if it's visible to non-members or not. The dig life one is running on that tool so you can see cool. an instantiation of it. Thank you. So it's it's modern and it was picked by people who know tech. So <laughs> it's not like an old style wiki. It's it's fast and but should we use Dig Life's wiki for that work or should we create a new one? I'm happy to host. I'm Can used to somebody hosting. who's not a Dig Life member just click on the link that I put above. Jack's? I did I did and it works. That's fine. Oh good. Perfect. And I'm a Dig Life member and Christina is one of the founders of Dig Life. And I, there may be several other Dig Life members here, I don't know. But it, it, I, I'm really, there we go, Mark Antoine. I'm Editors really would need to be part of Dig Life and we'd have to figure out what the visibility, if it's 100% visible or if there's sections that are not, that are members only. Right. I, I can certainly set up another instance just for that purpose. And I'd be happy to, so that we're not, you know, filling the Dig Life space with that conversation, which is separate, <laughs> unless you want to host it, which is different, but that's a separate question. And what we're just before I turn yeah. it over to Pete, what we're with the conversation we're having right now is a conversation that I'd love to go a little deeper into at, during this workshop, which is uh, somebody else has invented something that's really cool, that's really close to what we want to do, but maybe not exactly. How do we collaborate with that? How do we not? How do we not create yet another resource that duplicates their effort and then forks it? If there's no need to fork, how do we participate in their game the way by their rules and the way that works for them? Uh, how do we make that a part of the, the rest of the assets that we're working on so that it integrates with what we're doing? How do we improve the tools that we're touching? All of that is part of how OGM works, right? And so, so this question of, should we set up a separate wiki that's clean? Should we go join Dig Life and, and be editors in Dig? You know, that's a really interesting question that we need to answer more broadly here. Um, and this not, is also and like we'll the brand ego question. Like it's also just universally yeah. an interesting pattern because brand ego, even with the most collaborative, most amazing people who has the ultimate URL seems to be like this sticking point. That's just kind of horrible. That's really interesting. Um, and so there should be some patterns about the conversation we just had now, Pete. Um, I need to talk to Mark Antoine and Christina about, uh, collective uh, sense commons uh, which has which is in the same space or or, or another place where we could host um, uh, pattern languages uh, Christine and I have already made an appointment earlier today to, to speak <laughs> cool that's awesome today yeah. is relatively free for me uh, I mean I'm work I have a lot of work but I can't no set schedule. Um, my, my question across all of those is how do we make sure that anybody finding OGM, if they dig in the right corner, finds the others? Finds the other people, finds the other projects, finds, what do you mean? Yeah, the other projects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I think that's one of the big important questions is how, uh, for me, one of the use cases that I want to solve for is uh, new, new individual, new, new entity, organization. How, what is their, their journey, just to use the language of user journeys, what, what, is, or what is their journey in through what OGM does and how do they find their way to some place where they might 
want to put energy into something that we're doing? How do we find our way to help them and their organization? Like, what is the, what is the exchange of value there? How does that work? And that one answer to that is there would be a role in OGM called the human router or some variant of that, which is people who just know where things are. And what you do is you go and you have a, you have a chat with the human router and they go, they're like, oh, you should talk to Pete and Ann and Ken and then go look at these two links right here. And, and that is the old school way to solve this problem. And it's really good because it forms relationships. It's, it's sticky, it's social. You start to figure out how things work by, by the mere interaction with people. That's a great solution to this. Another answer is we find somebody's machine learning and we apply you know, <clears throat> some kind of search algorithms to the space of what we're doing. And there's a special query engine that only has a domain, a search domain of the project that we put into it. And then that leads you to, hey, here's five hits, go follow this, which is much less personal and maybe very good, maybe not, don't know. Just one small thing about uh, ownership. Uh, I've also set up a federated wiki farm on my server. And uh, being a fan of Ward's work, but the, because it's FedWiki, it means everybody can have their own FedWiki instance. Because I've set up a farm, they can have their own wiki instance on my thing, but then that's URL ownership. But the point is they don't have to. They can totally have it on their own URL and use the federated wiki mechanism to pull things together. And again, we could have an OGM federated wiki farm. I'm happy to help set that up if that's appropriate. But it does, I think it's less owner-y than a single mm -hmm. wiki. And I have had trouble loving FedWiki. I've tried, uh, I've tried a bit, <clears throat> and I can't, I can't speak in FedWiki just like I apparently can't speak in Kumu. Uh, Gene Bellinger tried to tutor me on how to make Kumu diagrams, and I apparently do not think, I think like the brain, I do not think like Kumu. I, well, that's interesting. I think, yeah, the things I would create were the opposite of what he was creating. And when I looked at what he was creating, I'm like, oh, that makes so much more sense. <clears throat> so. Okay. So FedWiki is an interesting ingredient here, but I, I would have a hard time playing in a FedWiki wiki. Got it. Yeah. Ken? Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to track this conversation. I think this whole thing around pattern language emerged from your question about how do we, as we're in the workshop, how are we actually going to document it? And I kind of wanted to loop back to that. Um, so having had this lovely, amazingly enlightening conversation, a lot of which I'm going to have to go off and research because I'm out in the dark here, but have we come any closer to what we're actually going to do during the workshop to, to track things? Um, I think uh, I've been part of a, a Kiko chat um, uh, open space where he set up ahead of time Google Docs for every single breakout room. And I think we should have that might be a really good idea to set up Google Docs ahead of time for all the breakout rooms, including not just a Google Doc, but perhaps a Google Sheet and a, a Google Drawing so that those who want to go in and, and create some graphics or want to try and put things in a grid and have people um, sort of documenting in real time in whatever form they're comfortable with. And then I think we're going to need a team after the workshop to kind of go through and sift and sort and put these things into place. But that's just what's coming to me as off the top of my head here. So a couple comments for this. Uh, one, if you can just ask, we have uh, five minutes left in this call, but if you can ask a couple of the questions that you're in the dark about, that'll help because I'm sure other people have the same questions. Mm -hmm. Two, we're, this is a very ogm -y question because like what tool do we use to share what we know? And, and one tool that people are answering this with is Miro. And I'm just, when I go into a big Miro board, I, I browsed one yesterday, which is the Noosphere map, uh, which got put on the OGM list. And I'm like, everything in here I love, I cannot navigate this sucker. This is just not working for me. Um, and so people are trying really hard to do beautiful you know, uh, information design in Miro and Mural, which is its competitor and other kinds of tools. So one of the big questions to ask and, and hopefully answer over time here is how do we get better tools? The simplest answer at this point is a shared Google Drive and a bunch of Google Docs and spreadsheets and drawings, which I, which I, I like a ton. And I'm, you know, I think most people are now fluent in those tools. They can find their way around. And, and if we're good about the curating afterward to do the cleanup and the, to, to make sure that there's you know, directories that lead to all the different documents, then I, th I think we're, we're doing pretty well there. So 
I think I think that's our near-term answer. I think um, I kind of brought up pattern languages as a wish list thing. Like I, I, I think I, as I started explaining it, I was like, and this is not something for the workshop right now. And then we were all like, no, we love pattern languages. So I think that by the time of the workshop, we'll have a wiki going. And some of us may, sub, may break out and start doing pattern language -y kind of stuff during and for the workshop as a way of consolidating and condensing what we're learning and what we're, what we're deciding together. And we can easily elaborate any of the patterns to have links out to those Google Docs, to whatever else, to wherever the specifics are that inform uh, that particular pattern. And I think that would be really rich and interesting. And so, and so it could be that a month from now, we, we tell newbies, hey, go start at this pattern and just nose around for an hour and then come back and then I'll route you to some people. And that might be a really nice sort of onboarding process. I don't know, I'm, I'm making this up as we talk, but I'm hoping that through the workshop, we start getting some of these things uh, in, in place in a, in a good enough kind of way. And I found some of those links, the, the best is the enemy of the good uh, from R Richard Gabriel, who is a, a genius. Last I, questions? Go ahead, Mark and John. I thought we would do some, um, mm -hmm of the pattern language before the meeting. So we would know how to connect better and ask people to pre-fill, like you, you're speaking of doing pattern language work after. And of course it's not mutually exclusive, but just checking on the before part. I was, I was thinking originally that pattern language would have to come after. It sounds like it's like a, a thing of the moment right now. So the moment any of you have a pattern language hosting spot up, we will probably start doing one for this. So I, I agree with what you just said. And I think that by the time of the workshop, we'll have a fledgling language kind of uh, starting to do things. Uh, sorry, Pete, go ahead. Um, one of the th things I heard Marc Antoine bring up when he talked, when he said anti-patterns, uh, right before that, I think he said, one of the things uh, in an, an emergent situation is that you don't actually have a repertoire of patterns that you have collected together that you know, you've curated in your head or whatever. So each of us has different patterns, but there isn't, you know, there couldn't be in a way a, a set of wisdom that's a pattern language. Um, so I think wherever we end up pattern languaging, um, uh, and Christina's right, um, some patterns help emergence happen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think, I think it's, I, I think, I think linking and, and uh, easy capturing is important. And I think also being able to capture anti-patterns as, as well is important. And then a, a last thought along this, and in, in programming very often now at the top of your program, you'll basically include libraries. You'll be like, you know, include this, include this, include this, include this, which then for your program gives you a bunch of features and calls and functions you can then execute during your program. <clears throat> and and the, the existence of these libraries is hugely important to programming. <clears throat> so I'm starting to think that we can also include pattern languages. So that, for example, um, OGM cares a lot about discourse and democracy and deliberation. So there's an include statement or whatever the equivalent is in pattern language that says, go over and look at the wise democracy pattern languages language. It is included by, ref by reference in ours. Uh, go look at you know, the, the Portland pattern repository in terms of coding and, and agile and all of those things or whatever its descendant is, whatever its best descendant is. And we're including that by reference in our own so that we're not rewriting these, we're not, you know, and we can sort of weave into those other uh, kinds of pattern languages. I think that would work nicely. Uh, last thoughts, closing thoughts. I want to end right on the hour, which is sort of now. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, thank you for all the links. Thank you for the rich conversation. Unexpectedly enthusiastic about pattern languages, which makes me happy because <clears throat> my heart has always warmed up when I start thinking in terms of patterns and trying to create patterns. and and in particular because I love well-crystallized thinking. I love, I love few words that say a lot that are easy to remember. It, as, Jay, uh, as Jay Golden would say, sort of the retellable story <clears throat> is a form of pattern in, in a sense. Um, so cool. So see you all at 7 a.m. Pacific tomorrow on the OGM call. Go prepare some media for, for this thing. Go, go, <clears throat> go make something and put it in front of the rest of us. We will, we will absorb it and it will become part of the food for this whole thing. Marc Antoine, you have the last word. Uh, Pete, when do you want us to meet? Uh, Christine and I are gonna meet at three today, um, if you're available. I also, um, if 
if you don't shut the Zoom right away, I can go grab the link for the Dig Life uh, Zoom, which is next for me. Cool. Happy to uh, happy to uh, keep this open until you've got that link in here. Thanks. Thank you. Any other last minute things? Cool. Um, for those of you who had never heard of pattern languages, you have a little bit of browsing to do, which would be fun. <clears throat> um, a pattern language is a great book to just pick up and drop in any place. It's a little yellow covered, yellow jacketed book that's just really beautiful. I've got it on the shelf outside here. <clears throat> um, and it's just kind of inspiring to see what happens when people try to, try to explain something given the tradition and the, the, the knowledge of whatever their domain was. <clears throat> cool, so there's the Zoom. Um, Stacey, do you want to jump in? Yeah, can I, can I get a copy of this with the chat? Because I'm on a phone and I can't mm. save the chat. I am and going I to, I'm go, as I usually do, I'm going to post, uh, I'm going to upload the video to YouTube. I'm going to send a note to the OGM list that has the chat and the video and everything else in it. So you will get all that. Thank you. Thank you. You betcha. You betcha. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow, some of you, most of you. Bye. <laughs>